Hey everyone, welcome back to Brian's Corner of the Student Physical Therapist. I'm your host, Brian Schwabe, and in today's episode, we are interviewing Brett Bousquet, who is a physical therapist, board certified sports clinical specialist, and certified training and conditioning specialist. He is a former sports resident with Vail, Colorado, in How- or Howard Head with- in Vail, Colorado, and is currently a physical therapist with the Milwaukee Bucks. Brett, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. So for those of us that haven't met you, can you tell us a little bit about your journey from physical therapy school all the way up until your current role as a physical therapist with the Bucks? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think the big thing is like get out a map because that's kind of what it takes, in my opinion, to uh, to get to any kind of level of uh, professional or higher end sport. So um, I started my PT journey in Pacific University. Uh, I finished up my undergrad there and knew I wanted to get into kind of some physical therapy, sports training. I had my own ACL injury at that time, which gave me a completely different perspective of PT, kind of knowing what it's like to be the athlete on the table. Um, and then I, I cycled into the, the PT school realm at Pacific in Oregon. And so from there, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do, but I remember the last day of class, one of my professors had mentioned something about a, a fellowship at Ohio State regarding baseball and having played baseball in college I was like oh my gosh how how are you just you know bringing this to my attention right now that sounds like something I'd absolutely love to do and I remember sending this email and you're gonna laugh at this because you know how like stringent residency residencies and fellowships are I was like hey what's the kind of timeline on the the application date is that like a running how like how strict are you can I just give you my stuff and do I just show up tomorrow or and uh, ended up finding out it was a little bit more. And so I had no experience with residencies and fellowships at that time. And so then I started digging a little deeper and, and realized that that's actually something kind of that I really wanted to do. Um, so I, my whole goal, my whole time, I thought I was going to go back to Canada after uh, physical therapy school. Being from Canada, um, that was just kind of the, the plan. And so I was like, okay, well, in order to get my Canadian license, it'll take about a year. So why don't I try travel therapy? I haven't been across the U.S. yet, and there's some different places I'll get to see. So I did uh, travel therapy. I moved out to Maryland. Was unable to get a job in Maryland. So I've never been out to the East Coast, really. And so my recruiter was like, well, get your Texas license. You'll be able to get a job in Texas and no problem. It's like, okay. So I remember driving out, still without a job. Had just got my license and was like interviewing pretty much as I was driving over to Texas. Worked in a skilled nursing facility, hated it, hated every second of it. And I, I was the kind that knew I wanted outpatient orthopedic or sports, something along those lines in PT school. And so I skated around that like inpatient kind of rehab skilled nursing thing. Um, and so when I, when I actually got to experience it, I, was, I felt like I was losing my, my hands-on skills. I was losing kind of like any progression type skills. And I was just there as a warm body to get people up and moving and not to take anything away from the skilled nursing profession. It just was not necessarily what really got me going. So after Texas, I moved back out to Maryland, worked in a full-time outpatient hospital-based clinic. Uh, We had hour treatments and again, looking more to that sports uh, residency, I knew that you had to have your um, EMR, your emergency medical responder is what it was called at the time. So I took that class and then I figured, well, you know, I might as well be using these skills. So I reached out to a small division three school in the area to the athletic trainers and just went into the room, the, their athletic training room and helped them cover events on the side just to kind of get an idea what that side of rehab or PT or uh, sports was all about. And I really enjoyed that. So I started racking up the hours. I was working 410. So I remember every Friday I would go reach out to another clinician in the area and just kind of shadow and continue learning and just, because we all have that experience when you come out as a student, you're like, I don't know anything. Like no one's here to tell me yes, no, maybe. So um, I felt like I still needed a little bit of guidance and, and just more understanding now that I was fully treating patients on my own and didn't have anyone to t- turn to or didn't have anyone kind of directing things. Um, so from there, I started applying to residencies, ended up getting one out in Vail uh, at Howard Head, which was, uh, I mean, they, they definitely focus on ski and snowboard a lot more than just kind of your average um, 
sports residency, I would say. But the very unique thing is a lot of the research that comes out of there is based off of orthopedic surgery and PT, and we'll actually see the patient's day of or, or next day after surgery, and you're starting 45 minutes of PT right then. And I remember walking in and being like, how am I going to spend 45 minutes with a patient that's laying on the bed? And I remember walking out being like, I need more than 45 minutes to spend with this patient because there's so much I need to accomplish. And you kind of think like back to your PT education. And in a typical outpatient clinic, you're not seeing the first two weeks, sometimes four weeks of a patient after surgery. And so all of those small little acute things, you're like, yeah, we're already past that swelling and like removing the gauze and explaining all this stuff to the patient. And so um, that was one area in my career where I really felt like I took a leap ahead and, and I didn't have that education per se, or maybe I just missed it in my PT school because there's obviously a lot to focus on there. So I felt like that was a good developmental stage for me. Um, moving forward, one of the unique parts of the Howard Head residency is that you get to spend uh, five weeks out in Park City, Utah, working with the ski and snowboard team. So I was with the the moguls team in the just starting off in the summer so they're training on the water ramps and so these guys are training two times a day out on the ramps they're doing their strength and conditioning they're doing their rehab stuff or they're doing their like prehab stuff in the, the facility and so uh, during that time i ended up finding a girl out here and keeping in touch with her finished my residency uh we said hey let's try something out. So I moved out to Park City full-time, worked at a hospital down the road from the ski and snowboard uh, facility. And because of my familiarity with the ski and snowboard, they would send kind of overflow athletes to me. So they're a non-for-profit. So they, they can't necessarily see everyone that needs to be seen. So they prioritize. And so it's kind of a nice relationship that I had where they would send overflow athletes to me and I can still kind of work with higher end athletes in my profession. And then I remember one day driving up from Salt Lake to Park City. It's like a 20 minute drive up a canyon. And I got a text and I was like, hey, so-and-so, we used to work together at the ski and snowboard team. Um, I'm now with the Milwaukee Bucks. Just wondering if you're interested at all in working for the Milwaukee Bucks. And I was like, at the time, <clears throat> I knew I wanted to work in professional sports. I was continually doing you know, mountain bike race coverage, marathons, covering lacrosse, anything that I could. Um, just to, to stay in sports and to cover events. And I just didn't know how to take that next step to get to that next level. And I was like, well, this is an open door, but why would, you know, an NBA team want someone like me who hasn't done anything necessarily like towards basketball specific and like the top end basketball, but I found out later, like that's not necessarily what, you need to be in order you don't need to be super hyper specialized in one area in order to get move forward so uh I, I was like yeah i'll throw my name in the hat we'll see what happens with that and if something pans out great if not what a great experience to just see what an interview at that kind of next level is like and then um my wife and i my wife and i now we uh had just bought a house so we were about a month into the house and i get the text I get the call. They're like, Hey, come on out. You're starting September. And I was like, okay. So, you know, that's uh, one of the tough parts about professional sports or just higher end level sports. It's like, you have to be able to move almost at the drop of a hat, but just be willing to go to different areas and experience different things. And um, I have an amazing wife who's obviously put up with, she's still living out in Park City. I'm out in Milwaukee. So she's putting up with the distance thing for now until we get her out there. So yeah, it's, uh, I just, well, obviously with the state of how things are right now, um, this is my second season. So just kind of in the tail end of wrapping up second season, going into third and hopefully a couple more after that. Very cool. oh, long winded answer of how I got there though. <laughs> I'm not kidding about getting the map out. I mean, you went from so many different areas, but that's, what's cool. And this is what's been great about getting, different unique sports PTs on the show is learning about their experience and, and how they've gone from, you know, one end of the spectrum to where they're at now. And everyone has a different story. So very cool. 
Um, and, and kind yeah. of backing off of that. So tell us now about, you know, what your role is like in the organization and how that's different from what you were experiencing in clinical life, because I, I know it's very different, but I don't think people fully can grasp that. And I know you can't really completely answer that, but to the best of your ability, how, how, how does it work in an organization like an NBA team? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll start with just kind of explaining how I particularly treat in uh, an outpatient clinical role. So again, I was lucky enough to have hour treatment windows. So I got to do everything and I got to be hands on for the entire hour. So I'd typically start off obviously just asking the person how they're doing, um, getting that whole kind of subjective intake. I like to be hands on. And, and the more that I've worked in pro sports, I really like to be hands on. Um, get a feel for the tissue, try and manipulate or change the tissue as best you can or prep the tissue is kind of, I guess, a nice way to, uh, to word that in order to tolerate some form of load. Um, so I guess uh, kind of going back, my like little motto of, of how I t like to treat, I think a good PT is a, a good SNC coach and a good SNC coach is kind of a good rehab specialist. And as a PT, you need to be able to do all of that. So you're doing the acute stuff, you need to do the tissue prep and the hands-on and then prepare that athlete, that person for some form of load. So you're writing your programs, you're figuring out kind of where they're at in the rehab or what you're trying to get them to, to determine the type of load, the tissue that you want um, and moving forward. And so I had that entire hour and you could easily fill an hour if you have, you know, all those things to accomplish. And so then you get into a, uh, the NBA and how we operate is, we operate almost like if you think of uh, like preparing a sandwich, get your bread out, you put your lettuce, you put your cheese, you put your meat, and just kind of like keep passing it down as you go, just adding new things to it. And so um, when our athletes come in, we chat with them, make sure they're doing all right, um, regardless of if they're in rehab or not. You do your tissue prep with them, and then you send them into the SNC to do their loading and uh, strengthening or again depending on the phase of rehab or, or where you're at in the season and then after that they're warmed up and they go out on court and develop some of their skills um, so I was all three of those you know you're the you're the PT you're the SNC and then you're the coach in trying to like develop or like get them back to particular skills that they'll need to develop but then when you get to the NBA you have an expert in every single one of those areas so that you have to really dive into being a PT and you're assessing and making sure that um, everything is up to snuff, like you're not missing any, oh, there's, you know, a couple degrees difference in this range of motion, or this is a, this tissue feels a little different than it has previously. Um, so the role really changes from writing everyone's program to, you know, now it's a very big collaborative team effort. Okay, well, this is what I saw yesterday. Here's what they did in weights. Um, I think maybe this needs to be changed up. Okay, what kind of exercises, how, we can, how can we implement a particular load I'm looking for? And then do we need to push or pull on the court in order to get the desired stimulus for the whole day? And then you, you think in terms of like, okay, well, that's one day out of 365. Um, and then you need to think in weeks, and then you need to think in months, and then you need to think in terms of whole year. So there's a constant balance of where to push and where to pull, and you have daily meetings that are open and honest and you're trying to just collaborate as much as you can with everyone in order to have the best possible outcome for your athlete. So it, it's drastically changed from clinic. <laughs> well, and, and that's, what, that's, that's what you would, you would hope. Right. And, and, and I think you, you bring up a really good point where clinicians a lot of times dabble in strength conditioning and strength conditioning coaches dabble in, in rehab and being able to truly I hate to use with the word bridge the gap, but to um, understand that gray area better is so important, I think. Yeah. And I think when you get to your level, you've, you've made it very clear. You have to understand in that what the strength and conditioning coaches are doing and what your you know, athletic trainers are doing, what you're doing, and understand, okay, where does my role fit in this and how do I play amongst this spectrum between oh. – each side, right? Acute all the way back to return to play. Right. So that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point of how you bring it up. And I think that's where a lot of clinicians could struggle if they don't understand that trying to step into a role like that. Absolutely. And you know, like you can't fake it till you make it at that point. You have to have a pretty good understanding 
and, and basketball is just one facet of sports, you know, like our bodies respond to tissue loading. And so you just have to understand the sport, understand how you want to load the tissue. And then you just manipulate whatever variables you need to. So that would, in my opinion, apply for everything going forward for every kind of sport. Yeah, no. And that's, and that's a great point. And so that kind of brings up a, a different topic, but kind of piggybacks off that return to sport. I, I, I talked to a lot of different sports clinicians about this because and there's a lot of different ways you can go with it, even just the way you define it, for example. So tell me a little bit about what return to sport means to you, because you've had a different background than myself, for example, with different residency experiences, et cetera. Um, what does return to sport mean to you? And, and how, does that, how does that role of a physical therapist work with that return to sport in the NBA? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and my understanding of return to sport has changed as I've gone along from residency to uh, just being an independent clinician to now working with a team of absolute geniuses and like some people that are some of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, I would say now return to sport means full ability to participate at the level of competition that you were prior to injury. Um, I'd say previously return to sport is like, yeah, man, you know, you pass all these tests, doctor says you're great. And I think maybe before I would lie a little too heavily on these doctors to say, well, you know, you've hit your six month time frame. All is good. And you're like, well, what? You haven't done so many of these different aspects of it. And so now return to sport for me is something, and, and this is one lesson I've learned from residency that I will carry forward with me for the rest of my life. And it's the, the principle of working backwards. And the idea is, you know, you chat with the athlete, you chat with the coach, you chat with who you need to talk with. And you say, okay, when is the least possible date that we can get you back to this sport or to this activity? Okay, you want to compete in this whatever tournament or event on this day. Great. So here's all the things that we need to accomplish in that time. Here's how long it takes. And then you're always keeping in mind tissue healing. Um, and then you just kind of work backwards. Well, you know, we need our uh so basketball for instance you need your court specific you need your endurance in the court you need your five on five so that's kind of like your court phase and if we're just if we're not overlapping any of these things then you have your your power and kind of strength phase then you have your strength endurance phase i'm working back to injury then you have your protection range of motion phase and so it's not always you know in these fine blocks there's always going to be some kind of overlap between the blocks, but I think taking the understanding of, okay, like you have all of these things to accomplish. And meanwhile, every one of these little blocks has um, some form of criteria that's needed in order to advance to the next stage. So in your, your court block, say you need uh, so many minutes of five on five, which is going to be equivalent to what they had done previously. So if you're saying, hey, you used to play 20 to 30 minutes, I'm not going to say you played 10 minutes and you're good to go because that's not appropriate. That's 30, 33% of, you know, what they need. And that's, that's saying like, Hey, you want to get back to a 300 pound bench press, try 100 pounds. And if you, if you can do that, you're good to go. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. So um, with your five on five, then before that you want to do, you're making sure you're doing like full court scripting. So they're running up and down the court and the plays they need to at full intensity you're making sure there's some form of contact. You're trying to slowly progress every, each and everything up in order to reach that milestone of five on five, 30 minutes. Um, and so then let's look at like a strength component. Well, uh, you need to be able to do double leg before you do single leg. You need to be able to do it under load before you do it, you know, with like a, a maximum uh, explosive effort. So there's, there's, <laughs> it's like the matrix. There's the, there's a, a pill and a pill and a, you know, a, or it's, what's the movie, Inception. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a perfect example, right? Because there's so many layers. For sure. And so I would say earlier in my career, I didn't necessarily appreciate those layers. And I knew we needed to get it back to some form of strengthening. Um, but I didn't necessarily know the equivalence of particular strength measures with what someone is experiencing on court. And I think there's a big gap that needs to be bridged with that. And so something that I continually think about, you know, calf injuries are, are prevalent in the NBA. And 
there was some study or some something I, I read or watched at some point that said when you're in like a maximum sprint, the soleus has eight times body weight experience through it of force. And I was like, what? Yeah. Like if you load up a seated calf at two times body weight, people are going to struggle. And so again, how do you bridge that gap? And I'm not saying you need to be able to lift eight times body weight, but you need to think, okay, well, how can I get loads from two times body weight on a seated calf? to eight times body weight when sprinting. It's like, well, okay, well you can start running and you can start adding, you know, faster running just to like slowly step those things up. So return to sport is take on, taking on a completely different, um, you know, mindset and avenue for me. And, and the thought of, again, like that's just, that's one muscle. You have all these other muscles and all these other components to think about. So we do it in terms of streams. So you have your motion stream, your tissue healing stream, like a, a particular strength stream, a power stream, a court stream, a, you know, there's all these different and you, you're modifying each and every stream as you go forward on this progression. And so going back to the, the first chat we had, it's like start and finish. It's like we have to get all these things in and the athlete kind of is like, Oh my gosh, why wow, I didn't realize there was so much to it. And, but it, it gives them a little more investment in understanding like, well, the doctor said I'm good to go. And they're like, I 100% understand that from a, a tissue or just a, a pure time basis, you might be good to go because that's what research shows. Great. However, this is you and here's where you're at. And I think it, it holds a lot more volume and the patient or the athlete, whoever is there is like, oh, wow, this guy really kind of has a good grasp on return to sport or, or getting me back to what I need to get back to. And that instills so much more confidence in them, in my experience, yeah. Absolutely. You know, you bring up a great point and, and it's prepping the athlete for what's ahead, right? And I think even myself earlier in my career, um, I was fortunate to be exposed to tons of professional athletes because of where I worked and the doctors that were around. But what I've learned along the way is it's not just, you know, fixing them in that moment. You have to tell them, okay, if you're going to be running at 12 weeks, for example, then we need to hit these criteria. Let's say we need to do single leg squat for X amount of reps. We need to do single leg bridge. Now these movements have more meaning for these athletes. And more importantly, if you prep them for, okay, this is going to be a nine to 12 month process versus, okay, we're going to kind of see how you, how you do. They're already feeling good by maybe four to five weeks. I'm again, I'm using ACL as the most common sure. world, but these are conversations you have to have with them, their agent, everybody else, all the stakeholders so early on to get them invested, like you said. For sure. and to go back to the lower back, right? That's a very common injury with these long lever athletes in basketball. For sure. The, 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 and I'll speak from personal experience. You know, I'm always looking at different KPIs, right? Different key performance indicators to, to bring them to the next step, like we just right. discussed. So you, let's use that as an example. Can, can you kind of expand upon your thought process? Let's say you have a, a lower back athlete that comes in, they're like, oh, I'm locked up and I can't move. How does that, how the first like 10 days work where you're like, okay, these are the three or four things we're going to look at, or maybe it's one, I don't know, to say you're ready for phase two. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, basically what we think about, you know, we use the KPIs as well. And, and I've explained to my athletes like these tick boxes. And again, it's like, here's your, here's your KPIs. This is what you need to do to move to the next. This is what you need to do to move to the next. And then when we're done, we tick a box. And that, for me, it's like a nice visual for them to see like, okay, I've, I've done that. And so you start making sure that the tissue can tolerate movement. Um, so initial movements, whatever you need to do hands-on to make sure, I'm not necessarily one that's like, oh, this is out a little bit here. This is out a little bit there. I think it's just like a, a global movement thing. And if you want, you can dive in a little bit deeper. Um, but you need your squats, you need your lunges, you need your hip hinge, you need all these like key fundamental movements in order to move forward. So as quick as I can get an athlete off the table, I like to get them off the table if they can tolerate it. And then it's a matter of going down your streams to progress the load. So you wanna be able to do from an endurance standpoint and then from a strength standpoint. So from the back, obviously we know that there's a lot connected to the back. Um, and you wanna think about what, again, you're returning them to. So, um, I mean, there's no athlete that, plays basketball with their hands down there you know you have to be strong up here you have to tolerate loads up here 
And so you're thinking, all right, I, I need to know, load the lats in some component. I need to load the glutes in some component. I need to isometrically load the paraspinal muscles in uh, a tolerable, comfortable position. And so some of the lifts that we like to get back to are, you know, a uh, squatting position, a uh, deadlifting position, and then you're progressing from those loaded positions into more dynamic um, basketball type movements. So I don't just say, okay, we're going to go start with our deadlift today. I think, all right, so we need uh, an isometric kind of hold. So if you think in terms of how long a deadlift set is going to last, if you're doing just a traditional 10 repetition movement uh, or 10 repetition uh, set, call it 30 seconds. Okay. So you have to be able to hold your spine in a position for 30 seconds. So can you do just uh, a glute bridge for 30 seconds? Can you tolerate that? Okay, can you tolerate single leg now? Because now you've added a little bit of a rotary component. So um, that's kind of like how my mindset works now. So I'm thinking we're activating hamstrings in you know, a hip hinge type way. You're activating your glutes, the ISO, and then you need to move your paraspinals into a flexion and into extension position, and then just slowly adding load. So not giving anything away, but just allowing for freedom of, treatment like that's these are the things that i personally think you need to to think about as you move forward so like why would you start someone day one with you know a, a weighted deadlift when they haven't proven that they can do a single leg bridge or or even like a, a ghd iso hold like it when you think back to physics it just doesn't make sense yeah no listen and that that's and that's a great point because people like to skip the basics right we see you know, we're in the social media age, right? So people have all these exercises out there, but yeah. you got to do the basics hundred percent. And there's, and, and sure, that's not fun or that's not sexy all the time, but you know, they work and they're, they're proven and they're, they've been around forever and they're going to continue to be around forever because you can't skip the basics. Right. For sure. And I think the one place that um, we're so fortunate as PTs to operate in the, in this level is that I get to see these guys every single day. So I know how they did next day, or even like if we're doing a secondary practice in the afternoon, I know how well they tolerated, and then I can fine tune little areas. And so then you moving down the tracks or pulling back on certain tracks um, as you're going through that rehab. Yeah, so no, absolutely. It's so fortunate to see these guys. Well, yeah, but you know, and, but in, in some ways that that can be even more challenging, right? Because you're seeing them all the time, so you're you're familiar with them, and and there's that extra pressure of okay. I'm expecting this result. Well, guess what? It doesn't always work that way where you get that result immediately, right? That's why it's more of an art than a science with rehab a lot of times. For you know, sure. Not just one, you know, it's final KPI that's like, okay, you can do these hop tests and you're good to go. Right. It's testing batteries along the way. You have your buckets, right? And you're choosing, okay, what are in those buckets for this particular athlete? What's their history? All these contextual factors. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. so... Um, you know, so let, let's, let's take it one step further now. It, if, if you're giving them, you know, let's say they're, they're passing that criteria where they're ready to move to that strength conditioning phase or maybe the court phase, tell us a little bit about, because you're, you're lucky at, at your level where you can play around with force plates and, you know, all these other fun gadgets. How much of a role do those things play with returning someone back to, you know, the court, for example? Let's say that you took all these measures at the beginning of the year and you know that their, you know, their counter movement jump is whatever X, right? You know, do they have to hit X all the time or is there other components that are playing a role as well? That's the tough question. That's a really tough question. And, um, you know, it's great to be able to work in a team where you have multiple people looking at the data and making those decisions. And when it, it, it comes back to your preparatory period when you're setting up your KPIs, you know, you're not going to have an athlete or have a goal for an athlete that's unattainable. Like, like they, they did this on their best day. They came in after an off season where they were as fresh and as strong as possible. And they tested this astronomical number. And now here they are beat up 50 games into the season with an injury. They want to return, you know, maybe there's some outside incentives, um, but they're not likely to hit that number. And so you, you kind of have to weigh that, you know, and you want to get to a particular percentage of that. 
And so I think using particular KPIs to say like, all right, at this phase, in order to move to the next one, I want you at 70% of this. And so we will use some of that da data. And it's nice because we, I've been fortunate enough to be on a, a winning team for the past two years. And when you're winning, pain doesn't hurt as much and people want to return as quickly as possible as opposed to like, ah, this is a little nag. I don't necessarily want to make my way out on the court today. Um, and I'll say we have such an amazing group of players on our, on our team and our staff. It's like everyone is so motivated to come back. Everyone is, uh, you know, very motivational towards one another. And so there is always that drive to get back. And so we're almost doing the opposite of like, look, I know you're ready to come back and I know you want to play. But here's a number here that says the tissue is not ready to tolerate, again, the load that we know it needs to tolerate in a, in a game. And, and, yeah, maybe we could send you out and you'd be fine. Uh, but it's a risk and reward thing. And, and you got to think, like, you're working with these million-dollar athletes. And is a, a 1% or 2% risk of them getting re-injured worth it? Like, there was a couple examples in the NBA last year of risk and reward. And, and you know, you have the top-level professionals – dealing with these questions and so it's it's tough and it's it's never straight lace but we continually try to rely on the science you know the physics a group talk and dynamic and then we have an amazing coaching staff that's like why are we rushing them back we don't need them today we don't need you know it's like get it right and when the coaching staff tells the player like yeah we'll, we'll get you back in a couple of days when you're ready it's like okay well that takes a little pressure off Again, it kind of sets the precedence for I still need to hit all these values and tick all these boxes in order to move forward. So there are definitely times when the athlete's like, look, I don't care what you say, I'm going to play. And you're like, it's not my recommendation that you go. Here is, you know, again, talking and, and communicating with coaching staff, with front office, with obviously our own performance group. I don't think it's the best scenario for the athlete. And so then when you have all of that on your side, it's like, well, we're not going to send you up. You know, I, I feel great that you're, I'm happy that you're ready to go, but we want to mitigate our risk. And so we're not going to put you out. And so it's, it's nice to have, again, that communication built up. Um, I think I kind of skated around your question, but we absolutely do use those variables and do use different measures in order to kind of keep track of our guys. Yeah, no, listen, I, I'm glad you skated around it because – where my mind goes, you, you can bring in this other wealth of experience and knowledge and you can just speak from truth. Right. And there's nothing that's, you know, a straight arrow or a straight line with what you're doing. Right. And, and you bring up a very good point. And for those of us that aren't working in the NBA, which is 90% of us plus, you know, we don't understand that until we're actually in that environment and to say we are, it, it's impossible to say. So it's nice to hear that and understand that. Right. And you're, you're acknowledging, Hey, it's the rest of the team that are helping make the decisions, the coaching staff, it's all these other stakeholders, because yeah. really that is what true return to sport is, right? It's all the stakeholders have to hopefully be on some type of same page. For sure. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I think it's so important, kind of like you said, just to have the communication with all those different avenues and, and kind of, as we were alluding to earlier, to have an understanding of what athletic training does and what SNC does and what the coaches are doing and, and having a feel for that in your own body, you know, and, and putting yourself in those experiences so that you know what you're putting the athlete through. Like, I'm not saying you need to lift or jump as high as the athlete, but just know what, what 80 or 90% feels like for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, listen, I've taken a ton of your time up, but I want two more questions. Um, because I know there's going to be some that are, are going to ask, okay, how do I work in the NBA? You know, you get that, I'm sure you get that question all the time. Um, yeah. I've asked that to you as well in the past. Yeah. We've talked about things, right? So for aspiring students, aspiring, you know, clinicians, um, obviously everyone has different uh, paths and, and you've explained that. And so have other people that have come on this, but you know, what advice can you give from your perspective? Oh man, it's so tough. Because like you said, there's not, there's not one avenue in, in order to get there. I'd say just continuing with your education, being open to meeting and reaching out to as many people as you can, because there's a lot of people that really want to help and give back and, and want people to succeed. Um, I'd say that if you continue to put yourself in situations where you're meeting new people, 
where you're continually learning, when you're continually reaching out, when you're doing everything that you can, like you're going to rise to the top and people are going to find you eventually, you know, and uh, it might not happen immediately, but you also have to be willing to put yourself out there and to move across the country or like completely give up a life that you had somewhere. Brand um, right? What's that? <laughs> Brand new house in Park City. And then Brand new house in Park City and a month later, I'm not living in it. Um, and I just think that if you continue to work towards something and set your mind on it, like it's not going to be given to you by any means. But if you continually work towards it, and you have a passion for it, it will find you. And that's like, like I said, you know, I got a text while I was driving to work one day. I was like, Hey, do you want to throw your name in a hat? Absolutely. I would love to throw my name in a hat. And it, it took a lot of early mornings, late night, a lot of studying, a lot of freezing your butt off in very cold situations or wet situations in order to get there. But I wasn't doing it thinking like, okay, I'm 1% closer to working in the NBA. I was like, hey, I love what I'm doing. I love helping these kids. And I think if you have that passion and that drive, it'll find you or you'll find out that maybe that's not what you wanted to do. And what you're doing is like absolutely what you want to do. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love it. And, and that's, that's super inspiring. So very cool. Uh, last question for you. I ask everybody this. And you're in a unique situation because you are with arguably the NBA's best team, but where do you see your career in five years from now, five or 10 years from now? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I love what I do. I love working with athletes. I love working with, and not every athlete is an NBA player. You know, out in Park City, we have people that run on the weekends a marathon. They're like, I'm not an athlete, or they're biking four to eight hours. It's like, these are athletes, and these are the people that when you've taken something away from them that they love to do and you're able, or sorry, when that's been taken away from them and you're able to help restore that for them, that's one of the best feelings in the world to work with a motivated person. And that's kind of what drives me going forward to learn and to read and to listen to podcasts or whatever you're doing. Um, so I want to, in some capacity, be helping other people. I want to help some of the up and coming PTs because I didn't get here on my own by any means. You know, I got a lot of open doors um, thrown my way so that I could get to where I, where I need to get to. And so I want to give back. I want to educate. I want to work at the highest level that I can, but maintain a great relationship with my wife and, and do some of the extracurricular things that I want to do. So again, skating around another question, um, working with athletes in some capacity and uh, trying to be an athlete myself as best as I can, giving back however I can. Very cool. I, I listen, man, I can tell you're super passionate about this stuff and, and I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and, and talking about your journey and, and honestly just talking shop with you for the last 40 plus minutes. Uh, very cool. Awesome to hear some of your thoughts on basketball. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best um, for everyone else that's, that's uh, they're watching this, you know, uh, passes on to your friends that are interested in, in this and uh if you want to see more episodes like this check out brian's corner i'm a student visit therapist brett thank you again so much we really appreciate it i love chatting with you i hope uh do it again sometime absolutely man absolutely all, all right, right.